Right, I may have alluded to it last week, but I'm going to take a break from Revelation and uh, address the subject of fathers today. Uh, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to preach about how great mothers are and encourage them greatly, and then you're supposed to beat up the fathers and make them feel bad, right? That's the way it typically goes, I don't know. But uh, anyhow, I, know I just intend to be biblical with the message and hopefully highlight the love of our Heavenly Father more so than anything else. But for today, for this one session in regards to fathers, let us look in the book of Exodus chapter 13. Exodus and chapter 13, and predominantly we'll stay there. Uh, towards the end of the message, we'll flip over towards the New Testament. Exodus 13, and uh, in a moment we'll read verse 1 and 2, and we'll read verses 11 uh, through 16. In regards to the firstborn, and the firstborn of the Father's house is to be set apart. Uh, the word could be consecrated, set apart or consecrated unto the Lord. So this is a message that deals with family, deals with the sense of father, deals with the sense of firstborn. And it was required something be done with the firstborn. Set them apart. Consecrate them. It's firstborn in the Old Testament context represents the whole family. The firstborn is set apart, and that's representative of setting the entire family apart. And the implications of this truth, well, they are great. Let me give you just a couple. This is not all that we could gather, but the implications of setting apart the firstborn. One, it is a reminder that the Lord owns everything, including your firstborn, of course. The Lord owns everything. Secondly, it's a reminder of who is to lead the family in the setting apart children from the world. The Father sets apart the firstborn. It is the Father's responsibility to lead God direct and set the child apart unto the Lord. Thirdly, it is a teaching that is passed down through all generations. Pass it down to our sons, our sons' sons, and so on and so forth. And the main message of Exodus that is being passed down, the Lord is our deliverer. We want that to be known. I'll make sure my son knows, and my son's son knows, and on down the line. Fourthly, it's a verbal obligation that is placed squarely upon the shoulders of the father of the house. It's his obligation. It's what he's required to do. It is the law of God. It is the implications of the truth of God. You are to set apart your firstborn. Lastly, or I say lastly, this is the end of my list. It is the wisest way to produce good fruit in the generation to come. I was interviewed by a pastor this week, and he asked me, how is it that our country is in the estate that it is in? And I said, well, my answer would just continue to grow, but it would include lots of things. It would include the reality that fathers have not rightly learned the gospel and then lived the gospel and then communicated the gospel unto their children and their children's children. And as a result, we have a generation of uh, a people that have no clue what the gospel is or how to live out the gospel implications because it's not been passed down. And it's not true in every family, but it is true in a lot of families. And I would say it this way. Whenever fathers throw away their God-given position, then you can welcome your country to the homosexual movement. If you want to throw your authority and your position out, then you will embrace homosexuality in your country, and we are seeing that even now. Well, I, there was a very wise man that commented upon this subject, and the very wise man said this, train up your child in the way that he should go. When he grows old, he shall not depart from it. And the Apostle Paul seems to agree with Solomon when he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What a grand thing for fathers to be a part of and have the blessings of God of doing these things in obedience. 
audience. By the way, I don't know where each one of you may be in that regard. Children, fathers, wherever you may be. Uh, it's never too late to start. You know, never uh, did these things, never taught, never passed things on. It's never too late to start. Even if your children are out of the home, even if uh, they're going on, you have grandkids, whatever. It is always good to start now. This story of Exodus, just to kind of, since we've been in Revelation so long, let me make another couple of comments about Exodus. The book of Exodus is filled with glorious truths about salvation, and this text before us is not less rewarding. There's much here about the gospel. But the book of Exodus, it teaches us about the doctrine of sin and judgment. It teaches us about the doctrine of election. It teaches us the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. It teaches us the doctrine of the communion of the saints. It teaches us the doctrine of sanctification. It teaches us the doctrine of redemption, what we've been singing about even this day. The deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt is the story of redemption. The doctrine of redemption ties us directly to Christ. And that's where we will go towards the end. And as you will know, the Apostle Paul said in the book of Colossians, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and he has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And so these glorious truths come to greater fulfillment in the person of of Christ. All right, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate, set apart to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. And we're going to make a connection with man and beast at least at some juncture in this message. The first two verses here, the claim is, set apart the firstborn. What a beautiful thing. A totally depraved and wicked baby is born. My little grandbaby or granddaughter is going to be born in the next few weeks, Lord willing. Her name's Evangeline. And the first thing I will say is, one of the first things that was said when my child was here in the front of the church, I'll look at Evangeline, and you know what I'll say? That's the most beautiful bundle of total depravity I've ever seen. This is what it is. Total depravity. And we want to set her apart unto the things of God in order that it someday the Spirit of God would move upon the heart of Evangeline, showing her her burden of sin and bringing her to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I pray for, for her or for William, my, other, my grandson. We pray these things. Why? Because that's the most important thing. I don't care if William ever plays in a class and somehow gets into the wicked aspect of yoga. What I care about is if our heart is right with God. Set them apart. Teach them. Lead them. Communicate. Pray. Ask God's favor upon them. And don't quit until your life is done. Okay? We believe God hears us pray. We believe that our words and our actions have influence on children and grandchildren. These things are eternally significant. We want to make sure they're set apart. Consecrate. Dedicate. Sanctify. Egypt ignored the command of God to set apart their household. He had the same command, did they not? You better take some blood. You better put it on the doorpost up here. Because if you don't, the death angel is coming. Look, I don't have time for God. I don't have time for all of his nonsense. We ain't got time for all that. I'm not killing no animal and putting no blood up on my door. That's crazy talk. And all their firstborn were lost. Okay? But those who would adhere the command of God, sacrifice the animal, apply the blood, they were saved, they were set apart, they were preserved, and the death angel inflicted nothing on those children. But there was a great wailing in Egypt because of all the death that came forward. I submit to you in our day, in our country, there's a lot of wailing going on out there. Wailing that even I hear. Preacher, what's wrong with my kid? I can tell you what's wrong with your kid. Kid, you. 
That's what's wrong with your kid is you have not set them apart unto the gospel. You've not modeled these things in their life, and you've not trained them up in the way that a child should go. This is not always the case. There are godly parents who have godly invested, but still the kid has a depraved heart, and we pray that God would eventually use what the parents have sown to produce fruit in the days to come. But it is our responsibility to set the firstborn apart. I want to make a comment upon firstborn. Israel, in this context, is God's firstborn. In Exodus 4, 22 and 23, you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. You better let my son go that he can serve me. If you refuse to let him go, I'm going to kill your firstborn. But he made this distinction. The Father is saying of the nation of Israel, they're mine, and I'm going to set them apart unto me. You better let them go. Hosea 11.1 1, uh, also says the same. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Here's what God is claiming in this setting apart context. The firstborn... They belong to me. They're mine. The firstborn of your sons, you give them to me. That is the clear command of God. Even when that first child is born, the reality is that child belongs to God. You want a graphic context? Adoniram Judson and his wife in Burma have their baby. And there's their baby. They're trying to reach Burma, trying desperately to reach them for Christ, and nobody's getting converted. And at some point in the juncture, Adoniram's wife looks at the baby and said, Ah, this is the plan. God's going to raise up our child. He's going to come to salvation, and he'll reach Burma. And they put all of their efforts and energies into the child and begin to focus everything on him. The child died. And they came to this conclusion. That child belongs to God. And we have to trust our child under his care. And they returned back to their mission, which was to reach Burma. Even your own children don't belong to you. They belong unto the Lord. Whole family. The firstborn represents the whole family. Kind of like if you want an example, a captain of a football team or an executive of a corporation or some kind of ambassador. They represent the whole country or they represent the whole team. The firstborn represents the whole of the family. Or when Israel offered the first fruits of their crop, what they were saying is God owns the whole crop. So thus to consecrate was to consecrate the whole. Now we at least know why God was angry with Pharaoh. Pharaoh was attempting to murder God's children. That'll make a guy mad. Pharaoh's going to kill all of God's children. Well, God's going to defend his children, and he did so. A couple of points of application on these first two verses. God is the father of his children. And you're sitting there and you say, well, that, don't have, that doesn't move me at all. Look, at least think it through for a moment. How many people have lived their lives saying, my life is the way it is because my father's no good. My father did this, my father did this, my father did this, and my father didn't do this, and he didn't do that, and he didn't do that, and so I am the way I am, and it's not my fault, it's because my father was a deadhead. And people talk like that. And so I am the way I am, and I've inherited all this from my father. Those things may be earthly true, but let me introduce you to a different father. A heavenly father who loves his children, defends his children, fights for his children, sets his children apart, and a father who will be there eternally for his children. So in a spiritual context, I have the greatest father that will ever be. As a Christian, that's your statement. Don't, you don't give the world a false understanding in talking about your earthly father. Say, I don't know all what happened to my earthly father, but my father in heaven... Let me tell you about him. He's kind. He's patient. He's gracious. He's long-suffering. He's all of these things and so much more. He loves me. He cares for me. He's done everything on my behalf to deal with my heart and my eternity and my life. What a great father I have. And I take joy in my father. My father loves me, and I love my father. And we're in this deal for eternity together. A great father. 
And Moses was at the end of his life. He asked the nation of Israel, Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? The answer is, yes, he's my father. God made us. God saves us. God has rightful authority over us. We should learn from our heavenly father how to be earthly fathers. Set apart unto the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 11 through 13. Verse 11 through 13. Look at your text there. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and to your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall, and there's your word again, set apart, consecrate to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males, shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you won't give a lamb in its place, if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among you, among your sons, you shall redeem. Set apart unto the Lord. Offspring were given to the Lord. The way they were to be given over, passed over, the firstborn, this was to be done in their life. Now, how is it to be done? How is this going to happen? In the case of animals, observe. I'm going to set apart their firstborn. Let's talk about animals. The firstborn of a cow, the firstborn of a sheep, the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar and shall burn their fat as a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Cow, sheep, goat. Offered on the altar, sacrifice, blood poured out as, a, as an offering unto the Lord, an acceptable and pleasing offering. This firstborn of that animal is given unto the Lord. Okay? That's what you do. You redeem them by sacrificing them unto God. Talking about an animal here. Well, let's just say that here I am in this country, and I don't have necessarily the cow, or maybe I have a cow and I have some sheep, but also have a donkey. I got a donkey. Well, what in the world am I going to do with my donkey? And my, and my donkey just had this little colt here, and so what am I going to I have to sacrifice this donkey to God? Well, no, you can't do that. Because the donkey is unclean. So you can't sacrifice a donkey and pour out its blood and offer it to God because the donkey's unclean. You can't do that. You, you, you're left, you go, well, how in the world am I going to deal with the firstborn of a donkey? Well, you'd have to take a lamb and sacrifice it in the place of a donkey in order that you could keep the donkey. You offer the lamb in its place as a substitute. If you don't want to do that, you just take the donkey out back, break its neck, and kill it. That's your only options. This is what is to be done for the consecration of the firstborn. Can't offer the donkey, it's unclean. Put a lamb in its place or break its neck. Every firstborn of a man among your sons you shall redeem. Same text. Now we talk about man. The son, the firstborn son, representative of the whole family, is equal to a donkey. The firstborn and the donkey are parallels. The man is unclean. If you want to redeem or set apart your firstborn son, you offer a lamb in his place. You want to know if somebody knows about this story? Read Genesis 22 and ask Father Abraham about it. Okay, so you've got to have a lamb offered in the place as a substitute for your firstborn. You don't want to do that? Then break your son's neck and kill him. Because he's unclean. You can't offer him up because he's unclean. He must have a substitute in his place. Unclean, sinful, break his neck, or offer a lamb. Are you tracking? We're putting this together. You have this little baby. You got this little baby. It's the time. And you go out and you get a lamb. And you go over here and you kill the lamb. You pour out the blood as a sacrifice, setting apart your firstborn. 
And as life goes on, the little kid gets up and he's like five years old. Daddy, why did you kill that lamb? Why did you pour out its blood? Why did you do this? Why is Uncle Joe killing a lamb since they had a baby? Why, why are they doing that? Because you must be redeemed. You must be purchased. And so our options were to put a lamb in your place or we were to break your neck. And so we redeemed the lamb because we didn't want to break your neck because you're valuable and we love you. We offered a lamb in your place to set you free in order that you can grow up and be everything God's called you to be. Wow! Hey, little kid's like, you mean... You did that on my behalf? Yes, because I want you to know about the lamb. I want you to know about substitution. And I want want you to know about someone in your place. You say, man, that's so foreign to me. I don't know about sacrifice and animals and all that. Okay, then let's move it to today. Daddy, why in the world do y'all break that bread at church? Why does that preacher take that vase with all that red-looking wine and pour it in that cup? Why in the world does the preacher do that? Daddy, that's strange to me. Why is he doing that? Let me tell you, son. He's doing that to remind us that Jesus Christ's body was broken on our behalf. He's reminding us that the infinite Son of God poured out His blood in order to purchase us from our sinful depravity. And when we gather around that table called communion, we are remembering what the Lord does until He comes. Fathers tell their children that. And then when they're in the school and when they're in the life and they got all these things running through their heads and they say, nobody loves me, nobody cares, and I don't know if I'm important, I don't know if I should take my life, I don't know, I don't know how all this... And they say, but my dad, he taught me about communion, he taught me about Christ, he taught me about blood, and I understand my value in Christ. And I am loved because I have a father, and I have a father who would give his son to substitute in my place, and I've been redeemed. These things have great implications for the family as a whole. To be redeemed requires a price. Israelites redeemed their donkey. Surely they had redeemed their sons. Redemption, hear the word, was clearly an act of substitution. Substitution. Lambs died in the place of sons. Remember, you don't have to turn there. You can if you want. But Titus 2.14, in Titus 2.14, in regards to Christ, it says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us. The Lamb. See, these things start making sense. You remember John chapter 1? Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Lamb, God, Son. When you get the right Old Testament context and you find out Jesus is the Lamb and He gave Himself for us, then the value of Christ goes up exponentially. Jesus Christ was slaughtered in my place. Where they didn't have to break my neck. What a Savior. What a Savior. Those not redeemed by the Lamb of God, they will die like donkeys with a broken neck, if you will. Sacrifice to the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 14 and 15. 14 and 15. And when the time to come, your son asks you, Hey, Dad, what does this mean? You should say to him, By a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, (laughs) our Father in heaven, the Lord, well, he killed all their firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the wound. But all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. What a powerful picture child is born man and woman they have their first child the first thing to do is kill the lamb pour out the blood redeem the child first step on their parental journey consecration man and a woman praying seeking God together and the first thing we're going to do is bring redemption for our child 
The parents, in effect, are giving the child back to God for service to him. Now, you say, maybe you're getting lost here, so let's stop. If that is true, that I, as a parent, me and my wife, are going to dedicate our firstborn to the Lord, what we are saying is, we're going to do everything within our power and ability that God's given us to make sure that this child knows, understands, and comprehends the things of God. Okay? Whatever that takes. To the degree that if it becomes a competition between God and sports, we're not playing. When it comes to the position, if it becomes between God and other adventures that the world has to offer, well, the things the world has to offer are not interesting to me. They're done. Why? Because we've consecrated our family to the Lord, and if there's a competition, competition over. God's first. Done. Hey, let's pray about it. I don't have to. God's first and everything else is second. Our family must be in a position in which they can get the full benefits of seeing that Christ is preeminent. That's all that matters for the whole. You say, man, that's crazy talk. Look, I've seen what the world's got. That's crazy talk. All we can do as parents is set that before them, trust God with it, and see how the thing works turns out we dedicate we have a baby dedication children dedication around here in effect we're saying we trust this child and our whole family unto God knowing our children are a gift of God Abraham understood this as I've already mentioned I now have time to go through Genesis 22 this morning children in effect are like this so the other side of it is this the children say let me get this straight dad when I was a baby you dedicated me to the Lord. You had the option of breaking my neck or providing a substitute. That's correct. And you provided a substitute. That is correct. Child learns he has a purpose to serve the Lord, and he learns that a price was paid for his sins and that he belongs to God. Just, if you can, just momentarily... Think through the rest or the past of your life, if you can, in a sense. What is it that your father passed to you? What is that lasting, greatest impression that's passed on? I don't know what it is for you. All I know is, for me today... I want to pass this on that my children will understand redemption. They'll understand the gospel. They'll understand these things that are eternal and true. I don't care if my kids can ever ride a dirt bike. I don't care if they can ever run a 5K. I don't care if they ever play on the tennis team, the bowling team, the dance team, the chess team, and whatever the teams they got out there. And I certainly don't care if they ever toot their horn in the band. What I care about is, do they know Christ? and the value, and the beauty, and the worship of Him. All those other things will pass. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I'll go ahead and meddle. Can you imagine and stand before God, and God says, what have you done with your family? Oh, my son was MVP of the basketball team. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is your point? Oh, well, my kid can play a tuba. That's great. But does he know the gospel? My, my kid was the starting pitcher in Little League. I had two grand slams in Little League. I don't even know where the balls are. They, they, they were lost somewhere along the line. What does it matter? In relation to eternity, in relation to the gospel, in relation to my heart, what do those things matter if our children don't know these things? You know, nothing. The father was to teach all that was involved in this. Let me give you a synopsis of what is involved here today. Children are sinful. They're like donkeys. Children belong to God. Children need a substitute. Children need to be delivered from sin. Children are to live for the glory of God. Children need a father to teach these things to them. I had good news. The Father in heaven, he does all of them. He's a good father. He does them all right. He gives us his word, gives us counsel, gives us direction. He's a great father, and you can trust him. 
Verse 16, we have these sealed saints. This is the last verse. Sealed saints, verse 16. It shall be as a mark, seal, on your hand, frontlets between your eyes. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Strong hand for the saints. These are the things we're reminded of today. I speak to the saints alone here. Those who understand, have been redeemed, understand who their substitute is. You have a seal or a mark in your hand, frontless between your eyes. You've been marked out and separated unto the Lord. It's by His strong hand that He brought you out of Egypt, brought you out of Babylon, brought you out of the world, separated you out. He did this through the means of offering His Son as a substitute in your place. We've been redeemed. God gave his firstborn in Colossians. He says this, Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. That was in Revelation. God gave his one and only unique son to redeem unclean sinners. Think about it. This morning, maybe you're a donkey. Could revert to King James and maybe get your attention a little better. You're a donkey, and your understanding from the truth of Exodus and the New Testament implications that God the Father gave His firstborn as a substitute in your place poured out the fullness of His wrath upon His own Son for sins that you deserve to be punished for in order that you could be redeemed and go free and be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. He didn't redeem His Son, but gave Him up to redeem us. Paul says it's the best in Romans. He did not spare His own Son but gave him up for us all. Or, I love the way Peter says it, knowing that you were ransomed, redeemed, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. Not with perishable things, like silver and gold and all that junk, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that, of a lamb without blemish or spot. Your redemption was costly. A lamb was put in your place and slaughtered in order that your neck wasn't broken. What a lamb. What a savior. May we not be brought to a place of faith and love and worship of such a savior. Connections with Exodus, we no longer belong to ourselves. Once you've been redeemed, you've been bought. Paul says, do you not know your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God? By the way, no, I'm not looking to be filled with the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit, or slain in the Spirit, because I have the temple of the living God and the Holy Spirit dwells within me. Don't you know that it dwell, He dwells within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So what am I to do? Glorify God in your body. He redeemed me. He purchased me. He saved me. He delivered me. My only response is to serve, worship, and glorify Him for the greatness of who He is. I love the Heidel, Heidelberg Catechism. You like reading the Heidelberg Catechism, right? Okay. It says it this way. That I belong, body and soul, in life and death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins, has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil. He protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit its, His purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, 
he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. This is the catechism, bringing that identity, redemption, and all of that into an understandable way. The father purchases his sons to himself by redemption. That which is acceptable, a lamb, a spotless lamb, was offered up for that which was unacceptable. Donkey, man. Redemption is costly and it's messy. The price required was the God-man who poured out his blood on our behalf. We on the receiving end die to self and give everything to him. We jump in with both feet, fully committed. Here's my identity today and some of yours. I, I belong to him. I belong to him. Whatever he says is right. Wherever he leads, as the song says, I will go. Why? Because he bought me, and he's a good master. He's a good father. He's a good savior. He loves me, and he is worth giving him of my life. Not going halfway. I'm not putting in one foot. I'm not playing on the fringes. I've jumped off, and I'm all in. He owns me, and what a great master he is. Yeah, it's good to make decisions that way, by the way. Hey, you want to do this? Let me ask my father. Hey, you want to go on a date with so-and-so? I don't know. Let me ask my father. Hey, you want to go with us to go do this? I don't know. Let me ask my father. Hey, you want to be a part of this business adventure? I don't know. Let me ask my father. Hey, you want to skip church this Sunday? I don't know. Let me ask my father. Hey, you want to you go do this and watch this? I mean, we got this rated R show, but they don't have too much cussing and too much nudity in it. I don't know. Let me ask my father. Hey, well, you want to go? I, I don't know. Let me ask my father. Why do you keep asking your father? Because I love him, and he loves me, and I know that he always wants what's best for me. And so I keep asking him because he always gives me the right direction because he loves me, he protects me, and he cares for me, and he's given me a written manuscript here that has shown me how to live, and so I want to adhere my life here because this is my greatest good. Redemption of the firstborn was a family matter in Exodus. In, in the book of Romans, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to his image in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Our Hebrews, but you have come to Mount Zion, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the assembly of the what? Starts with an F, ends with an N. Firstborn. Come to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. All the firstborn will gather together at home. You see that? When all this deal is done, all the firstborn are going to gather with the firstborn. And they're going to gather together because they've been redeemed. And we're going to be gathered together for all of eternity. This is the price of redemption. It makes us, look, if this don't do something for you, there's something wrong. Redemption makes us a part of the family of God. I have a great family. You ever heard, from my, you know who my brother is? His name's Abraham. You, you know my, my other brother in my family? His name's Jonah. I really like Jonah. I, Jonah's a cool guy in my family. Have you ever heard about my other brother, Paul? Paul, it's neat how he got converted. He was walking down this road, and this bright light hit him. It's part of my family. This is my heritage. This is who I am. Do you know who my father is? Do you know who my savior is? Look, all of these truths and all of these characters and all of these real-life testimonies here, this is my family. And I've been purchased by the same price that they were purchased by. And one day, I'm going home. 
And as Martin Lloyd-Jones would say, I'm just pitching my moving tent one day's march nearer home. Every day, I'm just a little closer to home, a little closer to home. And when I get there, I'll be with my whole family, and it'll be holy, it'll be pure, it'll be undefiled, and we'll be in the habitants of the glory of God. We won't need the sun, we won't need the moon, there won't be any sorrow, no sickness, no sadness, and all of these things will be gone, and we'll have this great joyous festival in which the family of God gather for the feast of eternity and we'll always be filled with delight forever and ever and ever. That's our family. Take these glorious truths and give them to the next generation. Teach these things to your children. It's not anybody else's responsibility. Tell your children the story of Exodus. Show them redemption in Christ. Tell them the story of communion. Explain the bread and explain the cup. Explain what Christ has done to redeem them. Point them to Christ. Talk of Him often. Live out godly lives before your children. Bring them to church. Place them under the preached Word of God. Do that. And all the things you can't do, do what you can for the glory of God and the good of your children. And by the way, as... I get older, my hair starts to get a little grayer. One day I'll catch up with Paul here. But even as we get older, it never ends. I call my daughter. I call my son. We talk about the things of God. Are you reading the Bible? Are you praying? I still ask those questions. You say, well, they're grown. I don't care, they're younger than me. I can ask them them questions. I can tell them what I prayed for them. We can read together, or even over the phone. We continue doing that. Why? Because I love my babies. You ought to love your babies and love them that you'll always be investing in them spiritually for the rest of their lives because nobody else is going to do it for you. And it's a great joy to be able to invest in your children in things that are of such value, and you will reap good fruit from it. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this word. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for your son being offered in our place. Thank you for his blood being spilt to purchase us unto yourself. I pray just momentarily, Lord, and ask, Lord, that you would do a work for all the donkeys in the room. Lord, that you would take them and show them, help them to see the substitute, help them to see Christ, help them to see the cross, help them to see the Son of God crucified, help them to see a tomb in which he was buried, help them to see an empty tomb in which he was raised from the dead, help them to understand the necessity of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, help them to value Christ, love Christ, follow Christ, serve Christ, bring that about this work of regeneration in their hearts. And Lord, for the saints that are in this room, that we would be encouraged and strengthened by the truth of the gospel, that we'd pass the gospel on to the next generation, we'd live the gospel, speak the gospel, exercise the gospel in our lives. It would not simply be a category or a, a mask that we put on on a certain time of the week, but it would be the reality of our lives we would live out this gospel in a very real and practical way that would influence the nations. God, help us as a church body to turn the heat up, make the light shine all the brighter, and may we live in a way that reflects well upon our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.